Hello. How you doing? Good to see you human beings, rather than Zoom pixelations. Um, yeah, really glad, really happy to be back in um, doing CDR sessions in person. You know, we've all had a very interesting almost couple of years, right? You know, so it's actually fantastic to be at Corsica again. Big up to Corsica Studios, people. Thank you so much. Awesome space. Awesome renovations. You've been busy. Definitely for the better. It's definitely great and very much looking forward to doing some great things. Um, if this is your first time, my name is Tony Wachiku. Um, you are at CDR. CDR is a platform for music producers and people who love music to come and share what you're working on, um, as well as having an opportunity to speak to fantastic, innovative producers such as Roska here. So give it up for Roska. Cool. Um, so the next kind of 45 minutes to an hour or so, um, we're going to just really, yeah, get some insight into Roska's productions um, and his kind of journey um, in the time that he's been, you know, sharing music with us. Um, but before we dig into that, um, how are you doing, sir? Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Really yeah? good. Yeah, man. So I hear that you have a new studio. You know, you've spent time over lockdown rebuilding a studio. Yeah. Yeah. So break yeah. it down. We're just going to get straight to it. Yeah. So what is, um, what is your studio setup? Yeah. Um, like every cable. Yeah. <laughs> every piece. We just need to know. Yeah. I mean, I start. I, I moved. I moved out to Kent because um, my house just got really small where I was living. So. Um, and there was the, the guy that, that we bought the place from, he, he was a carpenter, so he basically had this big shed in the back garden, and um, it was massive. It was like, not just like your conventional shed, what you think, but it's like, yeah, it was, it was big, and it had electric in there, everything, so I thought, let me, let me you know, get someone to build it for, like, build inside of it, and soundproof it and everything, and um, yeah, as, as time got on, I, I, got a, I was meant to get a quote, so my friend Swindle, he lives literally 10 minutes from me, and uh, yeah, he basically, his next door neighbor was meant to give me a quote, and as, he was, as I was waiting for the quote, um, he basically I just started Googling, Pinterest, YouTube, trying to find, work out how to do it myself. So I've done everything myself apart from um, electrics and plasterings. So it's, sound, it's basically soundproof. It's in the middle of nowhere, so it's like no one can bother me. So, yeah. Indeed. And, um, yeah, the equipment inside, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was getting to. <laughs> and then, you know, I forgot, you know, what I was going to get to. So with the equipment inside, I, I, I work quite inside the box a lot, but... I think as time goes on, now I've got a bigger space. I can, I want to sort of like get more into the outboard gear as well. Um, but um, generally, um, I use a lot of like uh, native instrument stuff. Um, I use UAD um, for like my processing as well as waves. Interface audio. as well? UAD interface, interface. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. UAD interface. Um, and um, uh, actually, no, maybe just the, um, just the actual, um, just the actual um, sound card. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, generally use that in, inside. And um, um, what else do I use? Um, yeah, that's the main. That's my main sort of like go-to plugins, really. Sort of na native native instrument stuff, and I've got like 10, 15 years worth of like drums and stuff that I've been like collecting and buying and sampling throughout of like my time making music. So yeah, but obviously, you know, the the, the um, years of having you know this amassed plugins and amassing UAD um, satellites, etc. It was obviously humble beginnings with just a PC and yeah. Fruity Loops, right? That's right. Yeah. So, so let's go right back to the beginning. Yeah. And you know your first releases. Yeah. Um, and your first setup. Yeah. So, what was your first, very first setup? Um, it was a Dell PC. Mm -hmm. um, that cost me about four hundred pounds, three nine nine actually. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a yeah, it was just Dell PC with a cracked version of um, FL Studio. Standard. Yeah. Yep. And um, yeah. And uh, what else did I have? Yeah, just a small controller, key, twenty-five key controller keyboard, mm -hmm. and that was me. I had. Um, I had the Motu um, sound interface for a bit, mm -hmm. um, and I had, um, what else did I have? There was, there was another one I had, but I remember the Motu one that I had, that was my main uh, mm -hmm. one, and then I was literally building up. Every time like, I would speak to someone mentioned like, we talk about like plugins and whatever, you, and like just hardware, they'd always say, you're gonna get to, you know what I mean, using a UAD or whatever, so you know, I, I, got, I got to that point like about six years ago, but yeah, it took me a while to kind yeah. of like, you know, bite the bullet and just mm -hmm. buy it. So in the, at that time, when you had the 399, uh, Dell PC. Yeah. What was the music landscape? You know, what was in You know, what was what? First of all, got you to decide to actually start making music. Yeah. And when you started releasing music, what was the scene like at that time? 
Um, so I started making music around uh, 99, and um, it was more um, understanding music um, from, like an electronic uh, from an electronic point of view of like, there was no one really around me that I could go to or speak to or even understand what, what I was doing. So it was more, it was just so experimental. Um, FL Studio was like the go-to thing. It's just step edit art and just kind of make anything. Do you know what I mean? Um, and, um, you know, when I got to about 2006, I, st I started to progress. So it was like, I was going work. Um, and then every time I come home from work, music was my, to make music was like my wind down. So I'd, I'd come home, take my tie off, and then straight away, hour, make music, then go and have some food. It was like, that was my wind down. And as, as time got on, I just got better and better. I, f I felt my progression, like, you know, in, in my beats and just the way I was making the music. And um, I, was, I was, at the time, I was into grime, so I was listening to a lot of grime and um, garage as well. And um, that was around about 2006. And then I was ready to sort of, like, start putting music out. And I, I lost a lot of music, like, a lot of the stuff that I was meant to put out. And um, during that time, I was listening to a lost lot it. How like hard drive corrupted? Yeah, it was, yeah, hard drive just corrupted uh, virus because it was that was the PC so, for but everything. But you know, you needed the backup, right? I'm not going to say that. Yeah, again. yeah, yeah. And of I, course. Knew, I know you've learned the that cra one. Already. The crazy thing is, I had <laughs> backups, but not of that those tracks. So it was like I felt like I just needed a restart. It was like a refresh of like. So I've got some of the tracks, but there's like I've got like two thousand three, four, and then five's missing and six. Do you know what I mean? So like. Backups were happening, but not as frequent. Oh, yeah, yeah, just that bit missing. Um, so yeah, I got to like 2005 and six, and I was listening to a lot of like House and Broken Beats and um, Brock, a um, lot of like Bugs in the Attic, and just like kind of like listening to stuff that was um, a little bit slower than grime, and just had like, it was more about the grooves and like just understanding like, um, um, you know, spaces in music and like, you know, um, how can I fit so much into one track? Um, without making it sound like just a load of garbage, you know what I mean? Um, and um, I was listening to like um, a lot of like Timberland's drum patterns and like um, a lot of DMB as well, Jungle, um, and just understanding like different drum patterns and yeah, just styles basically. No, I'm glad you've mentioned, you know, styles because for yeah. me listening, it's been obviously fantastic knowing your music for all this time, but yeah. you know, in kind of checking your music again, you know, I'm really, it's really great to see that, you know, you're muted. You've got your own style and aesthetic, yeah. but you kind of navigate. You almost like you know weave through. You know, it's not quite funky, not quite drill, not quite dr grime, not quite house. You know, yeah. you kind of, you know, you're kind of like curving through. You know, yeah. navigating the scene, which is great because yeah. I think a lot of the time, you know, particularly you know producers who feel that they've got to make a particular kind of music, you know, for a particular scene. Yeah. Actually, it's all about being a little bit sharper than that and actually, you know, paying homage to a scene, but also personalizing it, which is what you've done really yeah. well. Yeah, that's right. I feel like, you know, um, the only way you're going to stand out in a scene or a genre is is putting your own stamp on it. And um, whether that's um, going back into time and looking at what, um, it, what it started with and, and how they made it from the initial or looking at what is not being done today. Um, and also um, just looking at what you can do differently to what, you know, the top 10 producers are doing as well. And um, you know, and, and I've always liked to be unique, you know, whether it's, and, and a lot of my music is like, it's not about, you know, trying to be the best or it's about what can I do to make a stamp? What, what can I do that people can understand or, or look at in a different way? And how, you know, from a club point of view and DJ, it's like, how can I make my music um, stand out, you know, compared to what everyone else is doing? What can I do? And how can I make the DJs still play it as well? So it's, it's all those challenges as well as trying to make a good song as cool. well. It's like the Venn diagram trying to please, you know, DJ yourself and innovate. Yeah, that's all right, yeah. yeah. So let's look at that Venn diagram from a sonic point of view. I'm yeah. just going to play you a couple of your tunes. Yeah, okay. And, um, yeah, just talk us through, you know, when you made it um, yeah. and some of your thinking behind them. Because yeah. I've, ch I've chosen quite different tracks deliberately, right? Okay, so cool, just brilliant. to demonstrate what you're saying. Yeah. Cool. First one. Well to go, well to go. Yeah. Thank you. 
Good. <laughs> yes, so that one's Roscallion, right? <laughs> Do you know what? Like, there was a period where I was just making loads of tunes, and yeah, sometimes I forget the names of them because. Yeah, but you're yeah, so Roscalian. prolific, man, you know. So yeah, so, yeah that, that one, um, yeah. You know, it's like, I like to tap into um, the grime side of all my music as well um, and what I listen to and understand what I, what I grew up on as well. Because um, a lot of like the, there was like a sweet spot in like my, um, in like what I used to listen to of music is around 2000, 2003 of like grime. I listened to like a lot of like Wiley, like Pay Go, um, re a lot of rinse um, and um, and a lot of dancehall as well, and um, it all kind of like merges into the same sort of like like um, paint pot, yeah. like of like what was going on in London at that time, and um, what I what I was what I was listening to, and um, yeah, that that's how that sort of like the skippy drums was like a lot of like just grime and just just seeing how I can drop the tempo by 10 BPM to 130 or things like 128, but around that tempo and kind of still have that same groove and swing um, and the grittiness of it. Because during that period, like from like um, when I first started to, I'd say around about 2012-ish, a lot of my tunes, even now, but more then, it was like, it, was, it wasn't about mixing down the tunes. It wasn't about, it was just about how does it, how does it feel? Do you get what I'm saying? It wasn't even about how it sounded. It was like just just smack a limit on it and just let's go. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, that's with those tunes. The same with Roscallion. That that that's what that had at that time. And um, I think um, yeah, that one came out on Rinse around about 2012. I think mm -hmm. if I'm right. Yeah. I'm glad you've mentioned this because it's it sounds exactly that. There's a there's a rawness to it that definitely is reminiscent of yeah. kind of like you know grime tracks of, of the time. Yeah. And I like the fact that you just you know again. A lot of the time, as producers, we can get so obsessed with, you know, our master bus, yeah. you know, what's, you know, li limiting sidechain, you know, all that layers and layers and layers and layers. But yeah. sometimes it's just about kicks and snares, yeah. you know, and a dirty bass line, yeah. you know, and, and dung, literally, yeah. limiter and dung. It's, it's just yeah. about, sometimes it's just simplicity can go further than being technical. Um, and I learned, I learned that, like, early, and I just continued to just, just, let that go throughout my whole career, like you know, um, you know, you'll see it through like a lot of my productions. It's just a lot of them are just really simple, just basic stuff. But you know, I think as I as I got older and just learned, you know, I started messing about with logic and doing a bit more of automation and a few other bits. But generally, it was about just whatever I can do. In especially with FL Studio, it's very at the time when I was using it, it was very limited. So a lot of the time, you know, there wasn't you know, a lot going on or, you know, it was, it was quite technical to do certain things, like even just doing a bit of automation, you know, but now it's, it's a little more easy now, but yeah, then it was, it wasn't as easy. So, you know, you just go, you know what, just let me leave that. that. Yeah. I just. Yeah. <laughs> Classic case of less is more, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, so. exactly. Okay, next one. Thank you. 
Nice. Cool. So for me, that you know, you're kind of you're, you're exploring the floor four. Yeah. You know, you thought, you know, what, let me try and make something. There's a kind of on the house tip. Yeah. Go enter that kind of territory, but no, I'm gonna get bored. Yeah. <laughs> and kind of, you've got to switch it up. You've got to give yeah. it some swing. You've got to give it some some syncopation. That's it. So um, that was like I think it was like the probably the first year or second year of me uh, releasing music under my under Roscar and under my own label and. Um, I was kind of still finding my feet as well, I felt like, because I was releasing my music, but it was like, when UK Funky as a genre sort of like popped up, it was like, it was it was still quite in discovery mode at the same time. So it was kind of not, everybody was still like surprised or like, ex like, like I don't know, like they wasn't sure what it was. Do you get what I'm saying? So with that, it was like, I was still in sort of like the house mode, like what's, you know, what's, what, what's, what am I trying to do? Do you know what I mean? So I, I bought, my first release was like Feline, and then I had like um, uh, Climate Change, um, and then I had a few more, and then I had, I had that one, a TWC EP as well. So it was kind of like trying to find what was, where, where, I, where I felt I could sit down. And it was, to be fair, that, that tune, it was, it was like, because I was in discovery mode, I didn't know where it would take me or, or who would pick it up. And, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of cool to, like, look and see, you know, you've got on, like, fabric mixes and stuff like that, you know, during my time as well. So, yeah, again, with that one, again, trying to find space. How can I make a house tune not sound like a house tune, but be a house tune at the same time, you know, but adding broken beats into it, but getting house DJs to play it as well. So yeah. it was kind of, like, thought process behind it, but still trying to find out where I sat within... The spectrum of music as well. Yeah. It's, it's quite brave because I think a lot of the time, you know, we, you know, again as producers, a lot of us tend to obviously when you when you release something, you release it from a place of confidence. You know, yeah. you've you've invested a lot of time and effort in making a record, and then obviously investing in it somehow. If it's obviously your own label, yeah. But you're sort of, you're sort of saying, you know what, I'm going to bring this out and see where it sits. I'm not quite sure if people are going to be into it or not. I kind of got an idea of where it's going to go. Yeah. You know, so th that takes a lot. Not, Balls, but it takes some kind of like. Yeah, I mean, I had, I had a, I had a job at the time as well, so um, I didn't have nothing to really lose at the time as well. So, um, and I think that's quite important as well, like just to have something, so you don't feel like you're forced into doing something you don't want to do, to break your creativity. Do you get what I mean? Um, and um, yeah, that was one thing. It was like I was working night shifts, so you know, I'll go and press up a couple of records up in North, and then come back home south, and then you know, see how it goes. Yeah. And like, you know, luckily, you know, record shops were able to, were taking it, I was dropping them off, you know, um, you know, with, with pressing records, I was, I was very inspired by um, um, Wiley. I remember um, w listening to a Wiley interview and he was like, um, he had a box full of, you know, boxes of records in his, in the back of his car. Mm -hmm. And I was inspired by that, you know, I can do this myself, I can go out and, you know, have a, you know, my, my car full of records and go out to the record shops and sell them and go and collect money and stuff like that. So, you know, that was kind of a nice little driving incentive for me as well. So, um, and it was easy to press records up two weeks and, you know, your records are pressed up and... Oh, you know, bring back those days. Yeah, man. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you know, it was good, good, good times, man. Good, good times pressing up and, you know, again, yeah, with that experimental, like even on that, um, as a four tracker and one of the tracks was still a funky track mm -hmm. called Without It. So, again, I was still trying to feel and I, I do that with a lot of my EPs where if I do like three to four tracks or more, yeah. I'll have at least one track or two tracks that will be you know, a curveball, you know, are you going to play that? Do you know what I mean? Or something that people might not play or whatever, just to see if I can tap into that market or tap into, you know, or get other people to be a bit more, a bit more adventurous in the way that they play as well. So, yeah. So what was it like to, um, you know, but in the, by the same token, obviously the way um, Funky kind of emerged, you know, what was it like from your standpoint being um, a producer and a fan of music? What was it like to see the kind of, um, the funky sound kind of emerge and then almost like obviously go into the mainstream for a while. Yeah. You know, what was that like to be in that for you? It was, it was kind of weird. Uh, like, it was kind of, I think when you're in that, when you're living in the moment, you don't really think of it because like, I was saying this to some, um, one of the other producers as well and it's like, none of us were really thinking about like deeply what we're actually doing but we're actually making a new genre of music but we're not really thinking about what we're actually doing. We're just, we're making all these original tunes and DJs are just playing them constantly. And it's like, it's only when you sit back or like a few years back, you look back and go, 
we were actually was part of like some sort of history where it was actually making something where, you know, people actually, you know, like even now it feels weird like get people like messaging me or like at the clubs and be like, I grew up on your, do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, man, do you know what I mean? So it's kind of like looking at that and then, you know, looking back at what we did, it's like, it's just weird that we, we wasn't even thinking what, how it would be perceived like now or how, how it would be looked at. But at the time it was literally like make tunes, give it to the DJs, DJs play it, we release it and see what happens. And, and that was the, that was the rotation. We just kept doing that. And um, I was all, I was, you know, I was, I was a high believer in, you know, consistency is key. Just keep being consistent with the tunes, keep, keep putting the music out and seeing where it takes you. And, you know, a lot of the other artists, not, not a lot of them took that on, but I, 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 I never had nothing to lose because I never had a job. I had a job, sorry, you know, and it was like, I'll just continue doing it and see what, see what happens, man. It's a nice hobby. And were you ever tempted to kind of, you know, ride the kind of more mainstream coattails at any point? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of times, like, um, so i done I done a tour with KEB um, for um, sh when she'd done her first album. Um, I was, like, one of the warm-up DJs for her tour, and, you yeah, know, the more and more I listened to the tunes, I started adding, like, more, like, more bridges to my tracks, working more vocalists, and, and kind of, like, building something. But at the same time, it kind of, I felt like, I felt like even though it was adding to what I was doing, it was kind of taken away as well. I felt like it took away a bit of the grit and the, the edge that I had as well. So it's trying to find that balance of having, you know, good tunes, polished tunes. And, and like I mentioned earlier, when I was saying about like, um, um, you know, that, that period where I moved to like Logic and um, I, try, I was working with more automation and stuff like that, that was around that time as well. So I was trying to find that balance of having the grit and having, you know, sweet vocals on top and, and trying to find a happy medium where I can get good radio plays and still you know, have good club music at the same time. So again, it was like an hour thought process of what can I do to have that balance as well. I mean, did you ever feel a sense of pressure, you know, when, you know, you, from a writing point of view, you have to start considering things like mid lates and choruses and, you know, having um, productions that are a little bit more sophisticated because A, the benchmark in terms of mainstream, yeah. you know, the, the, the bar has been raised. Did you ever feel a sense of pressure to kind of... Um, no, because what I, what I made sure I did or done at that time was I consciously made sure that I didn't alienate my fan base or I tried not to. Um, so I always made sure that if I'm going to release a vocal track, I've got to release an instrument or I've got to release something that's going to be club based. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to do something for radio, then I've got to make sure that I'm going to be making sure that I'm not, no one's going to walk away and be like, you know, Oscar's gone. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and I, I, I understand that from like a fan point of view as well, you know. Sometimes you you know you're hearing and you know artists d may not want to go in that same path. They want to do something different. But I feel like as an artist, I feel like you have to find that balance of um, enjoying it yourself and also making sure your your fans or people that enjoy your music enjoy it too as well. You know, lots of layers. Yeah, a lot. A cool. Lot. So this uh, is, is good because it goes into this next track, which I think you know you managed to achieve what you're talking about.
yeah, that was that was around that at that time as well. That it was like I want to do some more like radio yep. stuff and yeah, and kind of again finding that medium of like keeping the grit but keeping it clean as well. Yep. Um, you know, um, yeah, that um, I got um, KTB's engineer actually mixed that one down as well okay. for me. So that was that made it even more cleaner than than usual because I'm used to mixing my own stuff and keeping it just. Yeah, just slap a limit on it, you know what I mean? That's it. Went. So that was, so having that, it, again, it changed my, my perspective of what I can do to make, you know, because it it's like with experimental music, you're just learning on the job. Like you're just doing, you know what I mean? Everything is just about, you know, you just add bits on to your arsenal every time you make a new tune or whatever and um, until you get to a point where you can do whatever you like. And yeah, during that time, yeah, it was good working with a vocalist session um, vocalist and and um, also seeing how they work as well because it was like work experience for me as well like you know seeing how someone works and seeing what they want from you and pushing you to a point where you know you're not used to all that do you know what I mean and, but you want to learn and get it as well and um, how different was it because obviously when you're when you're working on your own on your own you know you've got a vision for exactly what you want to do yeah even if you're in discovery mode right but right. you're in control of the track right yeah whereas I guess when you're working with a vocalist they've got different ideas of what song structure and where things are placed. So yeah. yeah, how did you navigate working with say Vanya for that? Um yeah, so with we working with Vanya was good. It was it it was like um so I I built part of the track already and then I sent it to her and then she already had sort of a rough idea. Then we then we jumped in the studio together mm -hmm. and then we we worked out what we both wanted and where we could take it. And then how I usually work is um once I've got all the vocals that I need, then I'll take it back and do post production and work out arrangement and how it's going to sound and then if we need more then we'll jump in the studio again and then once that's done then we'll we'll polish it up and get it mixed and what have you but um overall it was it was the experience was good because she was more experienced than me in a studio environment so for me and, th and that was one of the reasons why i moved from fl studio at that time because i was on a pc at that time as well so fl studio was only on the pc um and then so i, I, I got myself a macbook and I moved over to Logic and started learning how to do, um, you know, to record vocals and just understand sort of like more than what FL could um, show me at that time. Um, and then, yeah, shortly after, I mean, it's like, I think it's been about five years now, I think. So FL Studio has been on Mac, so it's been good to kind of get back. So you went, you went back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I opened up the PC, brought all the projects over. <laughs> old, old habits, eh? Old habits. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm glad you know with this with this particular track with Desire because I, I loved it because it was again you're in discovery mode right you know yeah. particularly with how you're working with Vanya but I like the fact that you know it, you've got you know the drums are quite you know, syncopated in the beginning yeah and it you know so it's kind of brock in places yeah. do you know what I mean you know yeah. but still grimy you know yeah. you've kind of got a really really good balance yeah but at the same time you know again in true Roscoe style you haven't you know a lot of it's unpredictable in terms of where there's some predictability in terms of the drops and stuff, but yeah. for example, there's no relationship between the drums at the beginning and the rest of the programming, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Was that something in, in, that was intentional on your part? To yeah, yeah, I feel, I feel like, um, even though I was still discovering what and who I am mus musically as well, it's, it's like, you still got to understand your identity as well um, and what, what you're, what you're, what you're going to do. And um, one thing I, I, I do with Rosca is I keep it, like now it's more you you know what you're going to get in a to a certain extent but i n i know what i should and shouldn't do mm -hmm. like mentally i can't sometimes i can't explain it but it's like i know what so you 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 so do you get up in the morning and look in the mirror and go is it a rosca day or not or you know is it sometimes, am i going to make a rosca sometimes. tune today yeah so you have to yeah, kind of almost like go alter ego kind of thing yeah i mean it, with like even with like so like over the last like 4 years i started making more dancehall as well mm -hmm. so even then, it's like it's a different hat. Do you know what I mean? So you've got to work out where you're gonna take where you're gonna take it. But generally, yeah, if it's a Rosca, I know it's a Rosca day. I know what limitations I've got to work with. I know what paints I'm gonna use to make this limiter. It's just limiter. Yeah, and done. Smack the limiter on. And let's go. <laughs> cool. So talk to us about this Presme track that you did. Um, yeah. Yeah, because it's a uh, yeah another fantastic collaboration. Yeah. Mm. So um, so since 2010. Uh, I've been like every 18 months roughly I go to Japan um and um I, I do a show out I do a couple of shows I'll play Tokyo and Osaka mm -hmm. and um and then I'll do like if I'm 
if I do a tour, I do like an Asia tour, then I'll go on to do, you know, China and what have you. So, um, so ev- I'd always go to Japan and they, they show me so much love. And they, like the first, first time I went, like the, uh, literally about a few months before, literally my Twitter, when Twitter was literally the one, the only one sort of like social media platform bar, Facebook and what have you. But it was like that there was, everybody was messaging me in Japanese. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to, copy and paste it, put it into Google Translate to work out what's... But literally, they do their research. They've done research before I even got there. So even though they didn't know who I was, they was they wanted to know. So they, when they go, and and um, it was DJ Zinc that actually invited me to come. Like, so he was going out there all the time and playing for this um, this um, this promotional company called DBS Tokyo. And um, yeah, so they, they brought me out and I played, I, I played warm-up to DJ Zinc um, over there the first time in 2000 and it was 2010 or 11 2011 and um yeah ever since then i've been going out every 18 months i'll go out there and play play a couple of shows and um I, it got to 2016 17 and i was like i've got to do more than this than play shows and that would be paid for it i want to do more i want to yeah. i want to build something because i know there's more to it and i built a nice little fan base over there and it was it was you know and then i got to i said to, i spoke to this label out there that i worked that i've been they, I'd, I'd always put them on my shows. Whenever I'd go, I'd say, look, these guys got me on my show because they know they, they play a lot of UK stuff. They play, you know, a lot of like funky or s- tracks that sound like funky as well over there. So, um, and I said to them, let me do a release on your label because like, you know, I think it would work well. I think there was, there's something there. And um, we started working. I said, send me some rappers. Send me some rappers that you work with. And they sent me a couple, um, one guy called On Juicy and um, another rapper called um, Nakamura Minami. Um, she's a... Um, um, young young rapper man, but she's got so much energy, man. And um, yeah, so we worked on we worked on a couple of tracks, done a double release, and um, before the release was ready, because they kept pushing it back, um, which was worked in our favour. So all, all through 2019, the release is getting pushed back to 2020. And um, when I was out there in 2019, I said I'm, I was literally in only I was in Tokyo for 12 hours. I was tired, man. But I said, but before that, I was when as I was getting there, I was I was messaging someone out there and said like. Can we film a video? I want to film a video. Like, so I went to I, I spoke to a few people and um, one guy I know he said, look, I can't I can film, but I can't edit. So he said, take the footage, bring an SD card, I'll film it. Mm-hmm. So we, we we managed to film it in um in uh, Shibuya, which is like um, in Tokyo. It's like you know the big crossing that you see on like most films, whatever you. So like we filmed um, under like a f- couple of footbridges and stuff like that. And um and uh, yeah, literally I was there, done my show. We filmed. Went, I went back to sleep, done my show. And then left literally straight after my show hour, got ready and then left and um, took the footage with me. And then um, January was ready to go to release it. End of January 20, um, 2020. And um, yeah, it literally was like one of their biggest tracks in like the underground for them, man. Um, but yeah, it just kind of like um, it's it's weird when you make it when you're making music, you don't really think about. I mean, sometimes you do, but generally when you think about it, it doesn't do what you think it's gonna do. But I didn't think much about the track. And I think because it got pushed back so much, I was like, you know what, let's get this release out. Mm-hmm. And literally overnight, it was crazy. Like the, the label um, over there, they were saying that they got, um, you know, they've had like blogs that they've never even heard of. They've been in Japan, like hitting them up. And, you know, they've got a lot of coverage based off that, just that one track, man. And, um, and by you p- just taking a punt, right? So yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I just want, again, it was just me just experimenting and seeing what I can do to, you know, merge two, you know, two cultures, man. And like, you know, me with you know with the UK sound and my Jamaican heritage with Japanese heritage yeah. and working you know trying to build something and and um, yeah it, it, it works really well man and I built a nice rapport over there with the guys over there so yeah so I'll play a little snippet from over here and then you can obviously work your yeah. discovery mode for us anyway yeah on there right so this is a track. Bro, 
okay, let's go, man. Yeah. <laughs> Break it down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it was like with this one, um, simplicity is key, man, for the whole the whole track. It was I learned I learned that especially with rappers and and um, singers, it's, it's all about having space within your tracks. It's giving them space to breathe and do what they want to do. Um, and then you can add whatever you want on top. But for this one, I just wanted to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, for me, it was like digging deep to find inspiration in, in specific tracks. And I'll, what I like to do is bring things back, um, you know, that, that, that we might, we will listen to. Like, so if you listen to like, you know, like Major Lazer or stuff like that, yeah. sometimes you can hear, you know, if you, if you listen to specific tunes and you can put things in and subliminally, you don't even know you've heard it or you've heard something similar to it. And I like to do that with a lot of my tunes as well. Like that, you know, um, just bring things in that, you know, you, you don't even know you're hearing it, why you like it as well. So kind of working from a deeper conscious rather than just always being surface as well. So with this one, I wanted to keep it as minimal as possible. And um, there was a lot of like drums that I was messing about with that, you know, that were different as well. And I was just trying to find something that could be, that could, match her energy and and come with something that's fresh that's that you might not have, you might not have heard before but you might have heard before mm -hmm. in a weird you know what i mean so it's like trying to find that balance um so yeah just like you know i'll give you an example um uh yes yeah, like even this <laughs> so like even with that it's like inspired by was that, like, was that her vocal uh, yeah. No, this yeah. is just another vocal I found. I, I sent that to her with everything already, mm -hmm. but it was like I just wanted to give her something like bare minimum, like just a minimal. So like what I gave her um, was basically um, this. Uh, let me get a vocal. <laughs> So this is what I gave her. Um, really, really minimal, um, even with like the, where is it? So just as basic as you can for a melody. Um, just kept it real, as, as simple as I can. Um, so, in terms of giving her something to work with, yeah. So no drums, just literally, just the. Just uh, so I gave her. This is what I gave her in total. So I gave her just this loop here, mm -hmm. but I just looped it around and then. You just loop that for yeah, five minutes and then you got her to yeah, run of, of that. Okay. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And like, you know, even like when listening to it, it's like, um, you know, it's kind of got like an eight bar sort of like grind feel to it mm -hmm. as well, where, you know, the bass goes from low to high to yep. low to high every eight bars. The and, tuned kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, every, I think it's every four bars. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, so it's got that kind of like switch that keeps it exciting mm -hmm. um, just for her to keep going. So we would like to see each track solo, please. I can yeah. hear it from yeah, here sure. somewhere. Yeah, so... Um, we start from the kick. Sometimes I put like a bit of, um, I just kind of like give it a bit of a shuffle as well. Yep. I, mess, I mess about with like um, a few different bits on there to kind of give it a bit. Sometimes I, I I play it in on my key. I play the I play the hats in my key on my keyboard, mm -hmm. and then I sometimes like to keep it real time. But I think I I, I um I quantize these as well. But sometimes I do 
mess about with my hats and kind of give them a bit more of a swing. I might cool. have this one. Isn't it? Look. And generally, do you keep your velocities, you know, at the same? Do you ever mess with velocities in you know, um, levels at all? Now, now and then I do more on the Rosca stuff because on the Rosca stuff I kind of keep it um, same because mm -hmm. it's always been like that. So sure. I kind of don't mess about. Just it very too driven, much. very yeah. just yeah. It That's is, right. It is what it is. Kind of yeah. Um, what's this? One? Nice. Yeah, so great, the great snare. Uh, you kind of layer it as well, so I've got this, that snare as well. Yeah. Um, and then the voice. <laughs> so is that two separate samples, and was, was one reversed? And um, so it's one sample. <laughs> and then what I've got is um, on the first <laughs> so. Oh, like a FL, pitch. you can okay. yeah, you can you can pitch it, pitch bend it. Can we see the data for it? Um, <coughs> not really much. It's like oh, okay. it's just basically it. yeah, just kind of change that. <coughs> Is that no information or? Um, yeah. So oh, it's, cool. yeah, so it's all it's all in key. Yeah. Um, if I. So um, it's like a glissando, glissando kind of thing. Yeah. So if I, so yeah, most of the time I think I I might have just I might have just sampled it and resampled it into okay. into the root key. Um, see, but yeah, it's kind of generally. So as you can see, like I've got it going down, um, sliding down, and then sliding back up again as well, yeah. um, um, just to keep that kind oh, of. That's so a great hook. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, just small percussion on this one. And again, do you, do you tend to keep your um, does Roska tend, tend to keep his product, you know, um, drums and percussion very raw, not not much use of effects. Yes, yeah. I mean even this, I think, if I'm right, there's not there's 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 a few bits of EQ on there. Yeah. But I use I use quite a lot of clean samples, so mm -hmm. if um, I don't really have to do too much to them. Okay. Um, so they're kind of pre-processed already, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Generally, like, um, yeah, I, I, I do like. It speeds up my process in making music because I can spend like I don't think I spent too long on this to be fair. You know what I mean? How it's long is not too long? Um, I could spend like anything from like half an hour to like four hours on okay. on like making the track. The whole thing. Yeah, yeah. just an idea and then rearranging it will take. It can take any time. Yeah. It's just a matter mm -hmm. of what I'll get down. But generally, yeah, I feel like once I've got the idea down, then it's just a matter of elaborating on it. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I try not to spend too much. I feel like you just you can overcook it, man. Do you know what I mean? Sure. It's like. I feel like sometimes you can just overthink, overthink. Even with mixing down, you overthink it, overthink it, and you end up having to just restart the whole thing again. Mm -hmm. So I try not to spend too much time in it, and I've, I've kept that throughout my whole Rosca like career. Sure. Just yeah, just minimize that. Limit are done. Yeah, that's it. Slap the limit on. <laughs> I might even have a limit on this one actually. Let's have a look. Um, I've, I've got the ozone stuff on there, so yeah. Um, but there is a limit. Yeah, yeah there's a limit <laughs> on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Again, nice. yeah, with this. So nice. again, like with this, it's like, uh, like I was saying before, like I use a lot of contact. Um, Native Instruments um, is sort of my go-to um, uh, plugin. It's just so much, just so much you can do in there. There's a lot of like real, real live instruments um, and sort of like things like this, just weird stuff um, that you can mess with that maybe no one's gonna use or yeah. you can just try and find a way to mess about with it. So yeah, with, with that and then um, um, got yeah, two different variations of that. Cool. And then um, yeah, just the bass as well. I think got two versions. Cool. So very nice 808 there. Yeah. Very punchy. And that does it. You did. You use the same 808 for the tuning of that. Yeah. yeah. So um, I use um, a plugin called R Bass on cool. that. So if I take that off. Okay. Big difference. So it just adds a little bit of weight onto yeah, it, just sure. to kind of give it a bit more depth. Mm. Um, and just keep it raw and club ready. And no compression again, just it's just a raw no, sample no with some yeah. sub. Yeah. yeah, just keep yeah. it raw. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, it's got the... Ro Rosca! <laughs> yeah. The standard? <laughs> <That one>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was actually, yeah. <laughs> Calling From, yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you know what, it's funny, I, u I used to, I used to MC as well, so yeah. like when, so. when I was making like a lot of my early tunes, I was MCing as well, so like the garage and grime was all, like sort of all my, thing and then yeah that was kind of like um yeah taken from like a tape and then i just kind of yeah because me and my cousin we used to record like garage sets and stuff like that yeah, yeah. 
but yeah, that's it really with that. It's really minimal. I, I kept it as minimal and uh, I wanted to keep it as simple and effective as possible to kind of give it, um, you know, to make it easy enough for um, Nakamura, um, the rapper, to just do her thing and, and see where I take it. And then it was either I build on it or leave it as is. And it just felt right. It just felt right the way it was. Um, so you gave you w initial build, send yeah. a loop to Nakamura, yeah. and then she just rhymed the whole. Yeah, where, where did they go from there? So when so um, she sent the vocals over to me, um, and um, yeah, I mixed I mixed it in my studio. Mm -hmm. I mixed the vocals, um, and um, yeah, I mixed the track and I mastered the track myself as well. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's can it's we can we see that? Yeah, can you open up the other one? Then? Yeah, Just yeah, I will yeah. do. Yeah, so. Um, the other ones, is that this has a v VIP as well. I don't know where I'll put the other one. So yeah, we, we can play the VIP. So, so with the vocals, um, I, I mix vocals down in um, in in Logic, and then I bounce them as one as one stem, and then put them back into Fruity Loops. And for what reason? Um, it's just I just feel like Logic's cleaner. Um, it's easier as well to just process um, vocals, um, and there's, there's it feels a bit more easier as well. I feel like Fruity Loops good for beat making and and getting the beats ready, but I feel like if if um, with with um, with um, logic, yeah, you can just do a little, just a little bit more. So, and so, do you think that if you'd built this beat in logic, would it be the same? Would it have been no, the same? No. For, for what reason? There's some. I don't know what it is, but um, there's something in FL that it just feels it feels right, mm -hmm. and I think the step edit it helps a lot as well. Um, it's just it's user friendly. Um, I can get the beats down much more quicker in in here than I can get in logic. Um, so yeah, it's just it's like little thing. Maybe it's just mentally. Uh, maybe I could, I could, maybe I could do it. But I don't think I'd get that same vibe. I feel like, yeah, Fruit Loops gives gives me that that edge over. Yeah. So yeah, with the vocals, yeah, I mix the vocals myself. Um. Fro. フロアだためますかそれ友達にしますかヒーセタミキャそもそもあんたを知らないなクレパスオンマイパーディポスカヌルカミ目立ちたがりみみトラスミミミミやったクジラが跳ねたチャンパンサカサのシャワーラッパー
I mean, I don't, and I've never bounced, whenever I went through vocals, I always pride myself on having 50 tracks, you yeah. know, with like lots of detail and I spend a lot of energy making it sound great, right? Yeah. Which is, has a value to me sometimes. Um, but actually, sometimes it's good to just actually make, you know, just refine your ideas. And so long as it sounds great, you don't need 50 tracks. You can, if it sounds great, just bounce it down the stereo mix, it's done. Yeah. You can just focus on other things. Yeah, that's it, that's it. You know, I, a lot of my peers, like I've seen, you know, I've seen, you know, a lot of producers, um, artists, musicians that, you know, that they've spent so much time focusing on perfecting one track that they could have made another 10 in that time. And, it's, and um, you know, it's just, it's just knowing when you've got to stop. When is when is when is the when is the cutoff point? When do you call the cutoff point on your on your track? When is it time to go? Okay, cool. You know what? That's done now. You know when are you gonna be happy with it? And that's and that's what it boils down to. If you wanna be releasing music all the time, you've got to just work out that moment where you go, okay, cool. I'm done now. You move on to the next one. Um, before I offer up to these guys, if they've got questions, yeah. um, was there anything particularly you know challenging about this track? It feels quite fluid from the way you're yeah. talking about it. Was was there yeah. anything else challenging? No, it's you? easy, man. The guys, the guys are easy. They had a lot of stuff going on at the time, so the the release they got pushed back. That was probably the only challenging thing, um, but it worked in our favour. So you know everything happens for a reason. I say with with things like that. So and on yeah. the production side of things, I guess it was pretty fluid. Simple, man. It was yeah. Everything was just. I'm, I'm very relaxed when it comes to music and releasing it. I don't really, I don't try and get too stressed because it's, it's a fun thing. This is like, this is a thing where I see it as like, anybody would want to be in a position where I'm at making music and be want to wanna be touring and stuff. So it's like, I, I don't take that for granted, do you know what I mean? So I always look at it and think, you know what, like I've got to enjoy it. I've got to, you know, look back and enjoy what I've done and what I'm doing right now. And um, that's all I, that's what I look at when I do these things. So everything is always sweet sailing most of the time. You know, um, but with this one, yeah, I can't say there was anything that really stuck out to make me think, you know what? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So, you guys, you got any questions you'd like to ask? How do you know when you're about to go? Have you said that? Um, I, 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 j I have a rough idea of what I want to put in my tunes each time. So, um, you know, I, I would always start with like drums, melody, bass, um, effects. Um, and I mix as I go along, so I know how it's sounding as I get to a certain point. Um, if I feel like I can't get the mix right, I'll, s I'll take all the effects off and I'll start again. Um, but generally, I'll go through and once I've got to a point where I've arranged it and it's got to a point where I feel like it's either club ready or ready for an artist, um, that's when I'll know. I'll know when it's done. So it's like, it's kind of just ticking boxes on what I'm used to hearing and what I, what I know from what my roster project um, requires um, to be a complete track. Thank you. Cool, anyone else? Cool, go for it. Um, I think as like as so I, I used to use um, ten eight seven mastering um, for my mastering, um, but I, I generally use that for like bigger projects, like s stuff like singles, like even with this one as well. I mastered it myself. Um, I just use like Isotope, Ozone just to master it. Okay, have you still uh, got the Isotope? Yeah. Plugging on there now. Yeah, I yeah, think. Can so. we have a quick I don't look? Think, I, I think oh. I don't think it's on. The master oh yeah, it is. Yeah. So um, I just use, um, and this is um, this is something that my my mastering engineer showed me as well. Um, um, I don't think, uh, I generally use like one of the presets and just tweak um, on the EQ and then I have like a uh, just a vintage limiter on it. Um, and and, that's, and that's, it, that's about it really because, because a lot of the sounds that I use are quite clean. Um, I don't really have to do too much. Um, and uh, generally if I feel that it's beyond me being, being able to master it or get it to how I want it to sound, then I'll generally send it away. But that's only come with time with me. It's like, um, I started just using the limiter, and then I got to a point where I needed my, I needed my, my, my music a bit more cleaner. Then I started sitting in on sessions with masterers um, and getting to understand what I need to do before I get to mar the mastering process um, and making my tracks cleaner, making them making a bit more digestible, um, taking off you know enough low end, um, you know not making it too too toppy as well. Um, and then it, I get to a point where my ears are tuned enough to be able to hear what a mastered track should sound like or what my track should sound like mastered. 
um, comparing it to you know some of my tracks that have been mastered as well. So um, yeah, that's that's yeah that's what I get to with yeah or how I know when I um, when I got to a mastered state. On the on the subject of mastering, so um, in terms of the actual master file, yeah, do you tend to make different versions? You know, because a lot of the time there's this talk about having you know one master for you know for CD, one yeah. for streaming services, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you what's uh, your approach to creating a master? I mean, uh, I, I generally I generally just try and make the master um, one just one one master, and I try and work out how it like. So um, and the last track I mastered was a track called I Know, um, which came out a few months ago. And um, I, I tried that on so many different speakers mm -hmm. just to get that, just to work out how it would sound on each. So I had it on a Bluetooth speaker. I had it on my speaker in my car, in my studio, and on my phone. I just wanted to hear how it sounded on all the different formats um, before I put it out. So generally, I try and do that before I get to putting it out. Mm -hmm. um, if I... I, I get why uh, people would say you need to, or why you do, why you need to a Spotify version, CD version. You get what I'm saying, but I feel like, again, you're just overcomplicating it. <laughs> I feel like again, it's just like it's just simplifying it for me. Um, I feel like if I've got the sound that I want, because a lot of my tunes is like, it's more for clubs anyway. Yeah. So having it on Spotify and stuff like that, I feel like okay, cool, but it's more for it was more for the clubs. But then as like lockdown hit, it's like. There's no club, so yeah, what do I do? Do you know what I mean? So then I've had to kind of work out what and listen to do a bit more sound testing and listening to kind of get that sound right um, and just find that middle ground rather than sort of like doing so many different um, formats or, um, yeah, sound formats or, yeah. And how valuable has Ozone been in terms of your, your work, you know, mastering workflow? I guess it was it the tool that gave you the confidence to say, yeah, I can master my own tracks? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a funny story. So the, the guy that masters my tunes, um, um, he, he took long, he started taking long to bring, like, get the tunes back. So I started thinking, you know what, let me just, let me just try it myself. Same with my studio. The guy who took too long to get back to me to, you know, give me the quote back so I can say, yep, yeah. you know what I mean? I just got, I just, well, you know what, let me try it and see what happens, you know? And yeah, it's been trial and error and, you know, I got to a point where I'm like, okay, cool, you know, I can do that. And, you know, if I do bigger things like an album, I'd want that to, I'd I'd, ha I'd want that to go to a mastering engineer and get that done professionally because it's a bigger project. But singles, I'm not too not too you know sentimental about you know as long as it sounds good, I feel that it sounds good. I'm comfortable with it. I'm happy with where it is. I've tested it out. You know, I've got a few other people that test it out. I'll go and, I'll go and release it. Yeah. Cool. So get you answer your question. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, okay. Cool. Got a question here at the front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like you, you just need to. It, I I feel like me learning learning to be melodic and like work out keys and stuff like that come that c comes with time as well. But it's like, you know, um, you know, even even just getting tutorials online um, and just working out like just basic key key structures and stuff like that. And even listening to like um, um, like you know, there's like a lot of like garage like like the poppy sort of garage tunes as well. Listening to those, man, some a lot of those are you know they have a lot of like the key changes um, and uh, just the way they're structured as well, you know, um, just an as, as, a, as an example of, of, how they, of how they work, you know, and, um, you know, just understanding, you know, what you can do and what your limits are with, with making a bass. So, like, and even with, like, working on melodies with bass, it's like um, one, one thing you can do is, like, put the bass in, a, in, like, a few octaves higher, work out the melody, and just drop it down a few, um, drop it down, and then sometimes you get a, you get a nice melody that way as well. Yeah. 
Um, I'd work out what bass I'm going to use generally. Um, I use a lot of sub bass, so it kind of makes it a bit more easier. Um, and then, but usually I'll try and find a melody. Um, sometimes I'll try and find, I'll find a melody first and then I'll, I'll work out the drums, but ideally the drums, because I know what genre I'm going to use it in, and then I'll work out the melody. But if I, and what I do is sometimes I'll take away specific parts of the drums, like maybe the, the kicks and the snares away, um, just so I can take away from it being that genre, um, just so I can work out a different melody and understand like, sort of like, so I don't get in a sort of like a repetitive process of making the same sort of sound each time. You know what I mean? So yeah, just uh, that, those ideas. So yeah, definitely try and like pitch, pitch the bass up so it's like sounding like a, like a, a piano um, and then work out a melody and then just drop it down and see, see how it sounds and then just jig it around. Yeah, yeah. You know what you can do when you get her back, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know that. Cool. Anyone else? Go for it. Yeah. 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 So I I generally do it when I'm making the drums. When I'm making the drums, then I'll 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 quantize. I'll mess about and give it give it a different swing. And then when it comes to the melody, depending on how the melody's set, then I'll have to either snap it back to the grid or work it work how I want it to actually um, how I'm going to actually fit it in. Because sometimes I can work on percussion and it clashes with the actual melody, whether I'm using like horn strings or like a, a standard synth. Um, but I try and make sure that everything kind of matches up. And then if there is space, then I can mess about with the, you know, quantize a little bit more and then give it a little bit more of a swing. Um, I, do, I do a lot of it on like either, um, I do it mainly on my keyboard, mainly. I've got a drum machine as well, contact, the contact one. Um, contact one, the, um, the machine. The machine, that's it, yeah. So I use that now and then, but mainly mainly the keyboard. I work it in and then I'll either quantize it or sometimes I'll just draw them in. Like I know I know what the Roska sound kind of entails, so I can draw in a lot of drums or work out how or where I want um, the snares or, or the hats to be and then I kind of, just experiment from there and try and make it different from the next track, so they're not all the same or they're all, you know, all similar. Last one. Anyone else? Cool. Yeah. 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 So I, I trust my own instinct most of the time. Um, sometimes I'll go like um, I moved. I moved to Kent, so I'm near Swindle. So I'll go. I will go to Swindle's studio, or I send it to a few other people that I know, um, and just just kind of get a rough idea if they can hear anything or if there's any ideas, or whatever. But most of the time, it's all in house. I kind of know what what I need from that track, um, and also if I'm working with a vocalist, you know they'll have ideas as well. Um, I'm always open to hearing what vocalists want to hear or want to take out or want to move around as well. So. You know, I, I, I always keep it open, keep the palette open, you know, rather than just kind of keeping it all in-house. No, your openness is great. Um, so, um, apart from Roska, the producer, there's yep. also Roska, the accountant, right? Yeah. yeah. Who looks <laughs> after the label. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Or is, yep. it, is his name Roska or is it something yep. else? No, yes, Roska or yeah. Wayne, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how do you, you know, navigate, obviously, making music and also running a label and yep. obviously all the other responsibilities around you know your music ecosystem how do you yeah um, how do you manage that um i usually like so um when i when i was working um i was working i was working at o2 shop in um in sutton and i was working in um, clapham as well and i worked my way from part-time to um manage acting manager and when i was assistant manager then acting manager um i was managing a team of nine so i had to structure my day I had to learn how to, you know, do specific things for the day, whether it's an appraisal, whether it is just, you know, stop um, the, the stop take or whatever. So as time got on, they, those things became a part of my life, as in to keep it kept me organised. So when I when I left work and I went into music full time, I wanted to keep that structure in. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that I was able to do specific things on specific days. So even on Sundays, I would write a list of stuff that I need to do for the week. Mm -hmm. um, Mondays, I'd probably do admin. And then I'll do studio and then work to, to the end of the week, whether I've got, if I've got a show or if I'm going to do something else on the weekend. 
So that's how I'd work out what I've got to do. So our, our admin stuff would be on a Monday. I'd do label stuff, work out what I need to do for the week. That's Wayne. Yeah. yeah cool. And then, yeah, it's usually Roscoe for the w rest of the week. Yeah. Or the alter ego. That's it, yeah. Again, yeah. That's it. Do, do, they, do they alternate days sometimes? Yeah, so, so it just if depends. If, if Wednesday's like Roscoe, Roscoe, no, Roscoe's tired. Yeah. Let, yeah, let alter ego come through. That's it. Yeah. So I'd, I'd, I'd generally work out what I need to do. So I'd have a list of music that needs to be either worked on or finished, and then I'll, I'll work on those depending on who I'm working for, and then, yeah, go forward. But what happens when, you know, things get really, really hectic? You know, I mean, it feels to me that you're very organised and, yeah. you know, very structured, um, which is fantastic to hear, yeah. you know, but when, you know, when it gets too much, what do you, how, how do you deal with that? So um, I go through periods with the label where we'll have releases and then I'll give myself a break because I used to, there was a period where I went non-stop and I, we, we'd had, like, every six weeks we had a release out and I was doing a lot of it myself. And I kind of felt burnt out. So then what I'd do is I'd make sure I have periods where I'd just stop and I'd continue where I left off when everything's calmed down. So if I go on tour, I'd make sure there's no releases scheduled around there. So no one, if, I'm, if it's my own release, or if it's my own release, then I'm fine with it because I can, I can talk about it and whatever. But I'd make sure that if, I'm, if it's someone else's release, I'm giving it 100%. So I'd make sure it's not around when I'm touring or when I'm doing specific other things. Um, but yeah, generally I try and keep everything within its own box. Um, if it does get busy, um, I do have people I can rely on. Um, I don't, um, the accounting side, I've got someone that does my accounting for me um, as well. So, and then um, also got um, uh, the distributors as well, um, which is a small distributor com distribution company. And they're like, you know, you can contact them anytime for help, advice or anything. So, you know, and they're always willing to help. So yeah, it's good to have like small unit of people that you can talk to, rely on and speak to if you need to change a release date can do that in no time do you know what I mean so you kind of keep it small but yeah so generally this is the kind of advice that you'd give to producers who want yeah. to obviously maintain being an artist yeah and an, and manage an alter ego but also manage a label right yeah that's yeah. it that's it you know um you know one of the things I always do is um if I'm releasing on another label I've got my own label to rely on as well so I'm not relying on that person for a repeat release or uh any relying on them for anything, you know, it's, you know, I always make sure that I can go back to Roski Kicks, there's my label, and do what I need to do as well. So I've got, you know, and I'll make sure that I, I think I own about 60 to 70% of my own music still. So I kind of make sure that, you know, I've got most of my catalogue as well, which is most important. Are you published as well? Um, yeah, I've got publishing yeah, as well, cool. yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And that comes in handy every so often, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, they collect royalties from places that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even have dreamt my music being played. Um, and they 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 push my music to be synced as well. And they also send me um, uh, briefs as well for um, any sync any advert opportunities as well. So, yeah. So, uh, um, what other advice would you give to producers who you know want to have a bit of you know have some control over their own destiny, but also you know a very time precious or time poor, I should say. Um, I think you just got to be organised, write things down, have a have a schedule, um, just to understand where you want to where you want to be. Have like a long term schedule and a short term schedule. So it could be a year where you want to be in a year, um, obviously realistic, and then have you know like a weekly one or a monthly one of what you want to do throughout the week. Whether you want to make one tune a week, two tunes a week, or one tune a month, um, you want to learn this. Um, and what I do is um, I take time to learn, um, not as much now, but if. I do it on the fly now. If I want to learn how to do something, I'd go on YouTube, go and look at a tutorial and pick it up. But, you know, always or give time for yourself to learn um, and understand your what you want to do and where you want to be and where your music fits in, whether it's club music, radio music, or whatever music it is, just understand where you want to take it and where you want to where you want to um, uh, position yourself um, in music. Um, and whether if, even if it's just for fun, you know, just work out how you, how you want to how you want to improve that and how you want to make it better and you know um, build upon what you have um, currently because there's always ways to learn there's always ways to build up and make your thing even better than it is or um, you know and always take advice as well just don't feel you know some people don't know how to um, uh, criticize and be criticized as well so it's just being open to understanding and listening um, to what you can do differently or what you can or what you shouldn't do or what you don't need to do so yeah so what um um releases you've come uh, got coming up and you know what music are you listening to now that's kind of influencing you as a producer um 
So um, my next release is um, should be about November, end of November. Mm -hmm. um, it's called um, Kaboom um, with um, a drum and bass MC called GQ. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, after that, um, I'm working on my album. So I've got an album coming out uh, middle of middle of next year, and um, um, I should have a few singles and stuff before that as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's me musically. I've kind of been just kind of slowing down, kind of working out what I want to do. Um, next and also just taking my time as well because I don't I know I've released a lot of music so I kind of feel I don't need to release as much as I do but just kind of you know take time and I do like releasing a lot more vocal stuff as well so I've been doing a lot more vocal stuff um, as for um, music I listen to it's a lot not a lot of different stuff man so like um, I listen to um, a bit of drill um, but every month I, s I set a playlist of like 10, 15 tracks in my car um, of what I, you know, just stuff. It could be, um, could be like hip hop, boom bap, hip hop in there, like Onyx Slam I had in on last month's playlist. Um, and anything from like uh, R and B. I just kind of like want to just hear music and just hear um, just different sounds and kind of like, you know, just take it in, man, and just 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 let it breathe, man, and. Um, you know, I, li I listen to a lot of my own stuff as well. Um, I do like playing my own music, um, not from like an egotistical point of view, but like more of like I make it. I make a lot of my music for myself, um, and you know, like I'll play a lot of it. And my daughter, my daughters love my music, so they always want to hear it. So I have no choice sometimes to play, even though it's cringy. So yeah. any any of your tracks that you're you know sick of? Um, I had a track called um, Higher um, on one um, with um, Jamie George. And uh, we done a video for it uh, on Tower Bridge, and um, yeah, my young, my, my oldest, she, like when she was about, which well, she's eight now, but when she was like four, she would sing it constantly, and literally every like we had no journey was complete without having that song. So yeah, that that kind of like, got worn down for a bit, but yeah, <laughs> but for good reason. Though. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Roscoe, it's been amazing. Thank you so yeah, much. No, Give up for Roscoe, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Thank you. Awesome.